This lecture is a part of our Udemy course on Introductory Structural Analysis. Join us there for additional learning content. In previous lectures, we presented and illustrated the process of constructing influence lines for beam and truss bridges where the structure is subjected to vehicular loads. In this lecture, we are going to examine the process of constructing influence lines for floor girders in buildings. Consider this two-story house. On the main floor, the structural skeleton of the house consists of three long girders. We are going to focus on an exterior girder, on this one. The girder supports part of the floor. To be more precise, the floor rests directly on a series of short transversal beams which transfer the floor load to our girder. The floor is subjected to live loads. These are loads that could change location on the floor, just like a vehicle that changes location on a bridge. Therefore, for design purposes, it is imperative that we consider the effect of such moving loads on the girder. Any time that moving loads are present, we can use influence lines to determine the load patterns that could induce maximum internal forces in the system. Note that the moving load is not directly acting on the girder. Rather, the load is transmitted to the girder only at specific points where the cross beams are attached to it. Our task is to construct influence lines for the girder for such moving floor loads. Here is a two-dimensional drawing of the girder. As I've mentioned already, the moving load is not directly acting on the girder. Rather, the load is transmitted to the girder only at the points that the cross beams are attached to it. As the unit load moves from one side of the floor to the other side, concentrated loads at specific points on the girder pop into existence, and then disappear. This load pattern is different than the pattern caused by a moving load that acts directly on the girder. Therefore, the qualitative approach that we discussed for drawing influence lines in the previous lectures is not applicable here. We need to adopt a different approach for drawing influence lines for our floor girder. Let's start by specifying the length of the girder, its support positions, and the positions of the load transfer points. These are the points at which the cross beams exert their influence on the girder. For this analysis, we treat the girder as a simply supported beam, resting on a pin and a roller. Since there is a moving unit load on the floor, we know that at one time or another, a unit load is going to be exerted on the girder at each load transfer point. For example, when the floor load is here, the girder would be subjected to a unit load here. And when the floor load assumes this position, the girder would be subjected to a unit load at point B. So, we can postulate that when the floor load is somewhere between these two beams, the load on the girder would be a linear combination of these two loading cases. That is to say, we can easily employ the method of superposition in order to determine the effect of the moving floor load on the girder. We can start by placing a unit load at each load transfer point, then draw the shear and moment diagrams for the girder due to that load. Here is the shear diagram for the girder when the unit load is at position A. And here is the moment diagram for the girder for the same load position. As you can see, since the girder is subjected to a single concentrated load, drawing the shear and moment diagrams are rather straightforward. Here are the shear and moment diagrams for the girder when the unit load is at C. When the unit load is at D, we get these shear and moment diagrams. These are the diagrams for the girder when the unit load is at E. And here are the shear and moment diagrams for the girder when the unit load is at G. When the unit load is at B, or at F, since these are the support points, 
Shear and Moment in the Gerda R0. Here are the shear diagrams and the moment diagrams that we just constructed. Collectively, these diagrams enable us to quickly construct shear and moment influence lines for any point on the girder. Let's see how. Suppose we wish to construct the shear influence line for a point in segment CD. Since the segment is not subjected to any external load between C and D, shear in the segment remains constant. That is to say, all the points in the segment would have the same shear influence line. To draw the influence line, we start by examining the shear diagrams, and make a note of the shear value in segment CD in each diagram. We note that when the unit load is at A, shear in CD is positive 0.5. For a unit load at C, shear in segment CD is negative 0.25. When the load is at D, we get a positive shear of 0.5. The shear force becomes positive 0.25 when the unit load is at E. And we get a negative shear of 0.25 when the unit load is at G. I am going to tabulate these values. Like this. If we plot these data points, and connect them using straight lines, we get the shear influence line for segment CD. Let's work on another shear influence line. Suppose we want to draw the influence line for shear in segment FG. Upon examining the shear diagrams for the girder, we can see that shear develops in the segment only when the unit load is placed at G. So, our table of data points looks like this. When we plot the points, we get the influence line for shear in segment FG. We can construct moment influence lines in a similar manner. Suppose we wish to draw the influence line for moment at B. Upon examining the moment diagrams, we can see that there is only one non-zero data point for moment at B. A bending moment develops at point B, only when the unit load is located at position A. For all other load positions, moment at B is zero. So, our table of data points looks like this. When we plot these points, we get this diagram, which is the influence line for moment at B. Let's wrap up this lecture by drawing the influence line for bending moment at D. To tabulate our data points, we need to determine the height of each moment diagram along this line. When a height is not known already, we can use the height to base ratio property of similar triangles to calculate it. For example, this height can be easily determined by equating the base to height ratios of these two nested triangles. Solving this equation for h, we get h equals 3. Similarly, for this height, we can write 9 over 2.25 equals 6 over h, or h equals 1.5. This height also comes out to be 1.5. And, this height is 1.5 as well. Tabulating these values, we get. So, the influence line for bending moment at D is. Knowing the influence lines for the critical points in the girder, we can easily determine the live load patterns on the floor that produce the maximum internal forces in the member. For example, if the floor is expected to carry a live load of 12 kN per meter, then we can use our influence lines to calculate the maximum positive and negative moment and shear values in the girder. So, this specific diagram tells us that bending moment at D reaches its maximum positive value when the floor is loaded like this. Furthermore, we can actually calculate the value of the moment by multiplying the load magnitude by the area under the influence line between points B and F. The area is 18. 
The load magnitude is 12, so the maximum positive bending moment at D is 216 kN. The influence line also tells us that bending moment at D reaches its maximum negative value when the floor is loaded like so. The magnitude of that moment is equal to the area under the outer regions of the diagram, times, the magnitude of the load. The area is 11.25. Therefore, the negative moment at D has a maximum value of 135 kN. We can determine the other critical shear and moment values in the girder in a similar manner. Here are two exercise problems related to floor girder influence lines.